Red Wine Production In red wine production, grapes are harvested and brought to the crush pad just like white wine grapes. And we also still sort the exact same way we sort white wine fruit. Once it gets to the crush pad is when you'll start to notice the difference. Here's why. First, red wine grapes are handpicked into lugs, then they're dumped from the lugs into the bins, and then transported to the crush pad, same as white wine grapes. But then, instead of going straight into the press, red wine fruit gets destemmed. Now I'll give you one guess as to what a destemmer does. Grape clusters go through a destemmer, which removes the ta -da, stems, also known as rakies. Grapes may sometimes be broken open in this process, but then a specific percentage of them are purposefully crushed. At our winery, we have a rolling crusher. So imagine two rolling pins rotating towards each other with the fruit coming through the middle. As the grapes pass through, they're smashed. So imagine a wood chipper, but much, much gentler. So why are we crushing the fruit? Well, crushing enables us to extract some of the juice initially. And then we form this juicy skin and seed soup. This is called the must. Must is what you get right out of the destemmer and crusher. It's the juice, the skins, and the seeds. Sometimes there's a few stems in there too. As you can see in this picture, there's little bits of green stems in there. So if the first reason we crush is to enable us to extract some of the juice initially, the second reason that we crush is to have better maceration of the skins. Now, maceration kind of defines red wine production, so let me explain a little more what that is. Maceration is the process where the phenolic materials of the grape are leached from the grape skins and the seeds and the stems into the must. Now, phenolic materials are the tannins, the color compounds, and flavor and aroma compounds. So what that means is the tannins and the color and a lot of the flavor and aromas that come from red wine are from the skins and the seeds of the grape. Now the word maceration simply means to soften by soaking. And like I said, this is where red wine really gets its color. It's almost all from the skins. So color compounds leach out of the skins and into the wine. Here's a picture of Carl, our MVP volunteer, loading grape clusters into the destemmer. So you can see them being pulled into the hopper at the top of the machine. And as the fruit passes through the machine, the stems are pushed out onto the ground and the destemmed grapes all fall into the bin directly beneath the destemmer. And you can see it's kind of like a purple soup. So once we've destemmed and crushed, now we're at primary fermentation. That's right, we ferment that juicy soup. Now primary fermentation functions the same way as it does with white wine juice, but now the yeast ferments the sugar in the red must. Now remember, must is the juice and the skins and the seeds, and maybe a little bit of stems in there as well. This picture on the right is what the must looks like at this point. So we're fermenting the juice, the skins, and the seeds all together. This is the big main difference between red wine production and white wine production. Now again, fermentation needs constant quality control and constant monitoring. But one big difference between white wine production and red wine production is also that red wine fermentations are generally warmer than white wine fermentations. And this is because warmer temperatures aid in maceration. And what is maceration again? It's the leaching of phenols from the skins and seeds. Tannins, color compounds, and flavor compounds are pulled into the juice with that heat. So red wine fermentation is really all about extraction and maceration. Now remember, maceration is simply phenolic materials of the grape that are leached from the grape skins and seeds 
into the must. Phenolic materials are tannins, color compounds, and flavor and aroma compounds. That is why we ferment red wine with all that schmoo. All that stuff in there is giving red wine its character. Now let's talk about what we can ferment red wine in. A lot of people use plastic bins to ferment red wine. Now these are double walled and appropriately sized to keep it at a nice temperature. They're easily manageable with a forklift as well, which is pretty convenient when you've got about 20 of these things you have to move around. Another option is to set a barrel on its head or its end and take off the top head, as in the opposite end, and dump your fruit into the barrel and let it ferment in an open top barrel. This is pretty labor intensive, but it's also pretty neat because you get some really great aromas doing this and it allows you to get some really nice oxygenation in your red wine fermentations. There are also some barrel makers that will create giant tanks uh, made from oak, which are typically more common in places like France. And so some winemakers can actually ferment their wines in very, very large oak barrels. And another common option is to ferment your red wine fruit in stainless steel. Fermenting in stainless steel would be a zero oxygen environment for wine. And we'll get to why that's important in just a second. Again, these fermenting vessels are simply a style choice. It really just depends on what you're going for in your wine. Now let's talk punch downs and pump overs. During red wine fermentation, bubbles of carbon dioxide that rise in the must will push the skins and some seeds to the top of the fermentation vessel forming a cap. Now remember, carbon dioxide is a byproduct of fermentation. So as fermentation progresses, you've got these little bubbles rising in your liquid. It's very important that the cap is punched down into the liquid wine or that the liquid wine is pumped from the bottom of the vessel over the top of the cap to keep it wet. There's two main reasons for this. First of all, this introduces much needed oxygen into the fermentation. And second of all, it also aids an extraction of flavors and aromas from the skins and seeds. So there's another mention of maceration for you. It's best to stir and mix to fully extract the compounds, flavors, and juicy deliciousness from the grape skins and seeds. Actually, the third reason that we keep the cap wet is to prevent spoilage microorganisms from growing on top in that drier environment. Now this can also be a winemaker style choice here. With pump overs, you can get a gentle extraction and maceration. With punch downs, if you're doing them 10 times a day, you can get a lot of extraction and maceration. Here's a couple pictures of what punching the cap down looks like while fermenting in bins. You can actually see that I'm standing on the walls of the plastic bin on the picture on the right. Now it looks like a simple process, but this gets pretty exhausting when you've got 15 bins and you've got to do this three times a day. That cap is actually very hard to push down sometimes. And here on the left is a picture of a pump over. This is a hose with a valve at the end, and you can see the juice that's being pumped out spreading over the cap. Now the tank on the right is a perfect example of when you would want to do this. I actually wouldn't even be able to reach down into the tank to punch that down with the punch that I own. So pump overs are a great option for the tank on the right. When red wine is done with fermentation, or almost done, you'll have a really soupy must because the grapes will have broken down and everything becomes a little bit soupier. So the next step is to use a stainless steel sieve and stick it in that must and pump out the free wine, leaving the skins and seeds and stems all behind. This initial wine that's pumped out is called the free run. Next what we do is we take that bin or tank or barrel of still soggy grape skins and seeds and we dump it all into the press. Then we press it. And then the wine that we get from this pressing is called the press run. And it may be a little more extracted or have a higher phenol content than the free run. Which makes sense if you think about it because it's kind of like when you're making tea and you take your tea bag out of your tea. What's left in your mug is the free run and the tea that you squeeze out of the bag is a press run. That's the same idea. 
the press run may taste a little more astringent and harsh than the free run. So now we're left with the pumice again, but this pumice has almost no sugar and very little juice compared to white fruit pumice. And you can see how dry it looks, but even still it's useful. Again, it can be used for compost, probably less likely to be used for brandy, but cows still love it. Now the free run and press run are pumped into tanks, usually kept separate for a while. And if they haven't completely finished fermentation, they do so there. After finishing, we go through settling and let the sediment and some lees settle out, clarifying by gravity. Next up is secondary fermentation. Almost all red wines go through secondary fermentation. Again, bacteria is converting that malic acid into lactic acid. Malic acid is the acid prevalent in apples. Lactic acid is milk acid. Lactic acid will give red wine a more full-bodied feel, and it works nicely with the extra phenols that you have in red wines compared to white wines. It's generally suited better to the structure of red wines. It fits the style. Red wines are racked a few times, since there's generally a little bit more sediment to be removed from the wine as it matures. And red wines generally take a little more time to mature compared to white wines before they're ready for consumption. This is mostly due to waiting for the malolactic fermentation to complete, which can take months, and for allowing your tannins to polymerize. And that's kind of a complicated way of saying waiting for your tannins to smooth out and become more palatable. Fining agents may be added to clarify the wine, but usually in red wines, the tannins that are naturally present will clarify it naturally. But on the other hand, if there are too many tannins, you can also add fining agents to lessen those harsh qualities and to drop some of the tannins out. Finally, we're on to blending, which we're all familiar with, but we've also added a blending tool. We can use free run and press run in their proper proportions. The most important thing is to get all these proportions and percentages just right for the best wines. Next is stabilization, which we also know. And at stabilization, the only change is that heat stability is generally taken care of by tannins, and cold stabilization becomes a little less important to the customer. So you've done it. You've made your red wine. Now it's in bottle and it's time to age. Let's look at the comparison of production for white wine production and red wine production. You can see I've highlighted where the pressing is done, and I really want to emphasize the biggest difference. White wine production is fermenting just the juice. Red wine production is fermenting the juice, the skins, and the seeds together, also known as the must. That is the key. So congrats, now you've covered white wine and red wine production.